Jesse Richmond here. I'm going to discuss with you a very difficult thing, which is change. All of us think whatever we currently do is the best. And to think that something might be better means we're accepting that we might be wrong. Should we do more than the current monitoring of patients with tests and examination in the office? Should we also test them at home? And if we should, which way? Detecting change is pretty much the basic fundamental thing we do in glaucoma, whether it's to figure out the diagnosis if you're unsure of the diagnosis or to figure out how fast someone is getting worse and if so, are we detecting the change properly and accurately so we know how aggressively to treat their glaucoma. Let's have a pretend scenario where you're monitoring a patient with glaucoma with one of two different types of tests and their eye will get worse, their glaucoma will get worse in August. For the first option, test A, test A is scored out of 100. It is the more precise of the two tests. If you were to test a patient and then test them again on the same exact day, almost always their test scores will be within five points of each other. You use this test to monitor the patient two to three times a year in the office. So the first time you had the patient take the test, it was in January, and they scored an 85, which is a good baseline. We now know about how well they're going to do. A few months later, we have them take the test again, and at that point, they score an 86, and you're feeling pretty good. Their score is pretty similar to the prior. You think that they're stable. You have them take the test again in December, and now they score an 81, which is lower. But if this was for me, if I'm one of my patients, I wouldn't be sure what to do with that information. It's within the test test re reproducibility of the test. And did they really get worse? I'm not sure. I'd probably have them come back and take the test again in a few weeks to see whether more is a tiebreaker if they're really getting worse or not. Test B is also scored out of 100. It is not as precise a test. It's test, retest, reproducibility is within seven points of the prior time taking it. But the big difference is that this test, test B, is taken 24 to 36 times a year, and it's taken at home. So I would now have the patient take the test in January, and I would tell them to take it multiple times. And they would score in this patient an 85, a 77, 83. It's your baseline. There's a little fluctuation, but you get an, an idea of what outliers may be. You take the test again in February, and the scores are in the mid-80s, and you think the patient's stable because they're pretty similar to the prior ones. In March, the patient takes it twice. You'll notice just the volume of tests, the volume of data. It lets you be much more confident whether or not someone's changing or if they're stable. In April, they were still stable. When it comes time for the next test in, in May, where scores are still in the mid 80s. And at this point, you're also getting a good feel of how much someone's patient will fluctuate with their test results. Are they more or less precise than other people? Now we're into July and our test results are still in the mid 80s. There's a little fluctuation, but in August, the scores are worse. Now, is this beyond the test test reproducibility of the, of the test? Technically, no. But when you repeat it again in September and they do poorly again in September, you can be much more confident that real change is occurring. Now, for me, I would have identified this about a month late. But this is a much better scenario than in test A when it was in December and I still hadn't identified and I told them to come back again and take it again to really be confident whether or not someone's truly stable or changing. The real value in home testing is the amount of data that can be obtained. If you can imagine, there would be no patient who in their right mind would come to your office three times a month, two times a month to take a visual field test. But you can ask a patient to do that type of, get that much information if they take it at home, whether it's with a home type of visual field or a home test like the one I'm about to speak about called Sparks. But the amount of data is the real key thing, which lets you be much more confident in detecting change earlier potentially with home testing. Now, I don't anticipate home monitoring replacing the testing that gets done at traditional office visits. I look at home monitoring as a supplement, additional information uh, to what we accomplish typically in the office. 
In my opinion, the ideal home monitoring test should be convenient for a patient, inexpensive. The results need to be valid. Just because you get information from home, if the information is not accurate and valid, that's not helpful. But also another key is that the information from the home test has to be easily communicated to the doctor or the doctor's office so that we, the information doesn't get lost. Our test is called SPARKS, which I helped develop. It stands for the Spathe Richmond Contrast Sensitivity Test. It is a website-based test where there's no hardware to purchase. It's accessible worldwide. Our uh, website address is www.sparkscontrastcenter.com. We have a data center. What that means is when the patient takes the test, the results are stored in a de-identified way in a specific data center so that the results can be compared over time at the website in one uniform location. You're not tracking down information from one test and then separately comparing it again and again. It's all in one uniform location. This is not a new test. Uh, this is new for home monitoring, but this is a test that's been used in clinical trials now for many years, where we've looked at the reproducibility, sensitivity, specificity. We've developed a normative database. Sparks has been used to study patients with glaucoma, macular degeneration, cataracts, refractive error, a lot of controls. And since COVID-19 hit, uh, we've made it available for home monitoring. Now, a common question I get is, well, why should we test contrast? And as many of you know, contrast sensitivity testing is rarely tested outside of clinical trials. Um, it really is not part of a mainstream for office-based clinical practice. But at the same time, all of us know that contrast sensitivity or detecting contrast is an absolutely fundamental part of our vision. I mean, the ability to distinguish an object from its background is pretty much a basic aspect of vision, which is incredibly important. The reason we really developed this comes from a trial that we did many years ago, where we took glaucoma patients and evaluated how well they could do daily tasks that were related to vision. We didn't ask them how well they could do it. We tested them. So we tested someone's reading ability, and they were graded, and they got a score. Or we graded their ability to recognize facial expressions, or detect motion, or how well they could read signs accurately. And you can see the list. But what was very interesting with this study, and we didn't go into it with a preconceived notion, but what we did is we evaluated these patients' ability to perform these nine visually related tasks. We compared it with a whole battery of normal ophthalmic testing, visual fields, visual acuity, stereopsis, optic nerve damage, eye pressure, contrast sensitivity, color vision. And to our surprise, in glaucoma patients, contrast sensitivity was a better predictor of someone's ability in real life than visual field. You now have some degree of a background as to why we developed this test, but I'm now going to show you a clip from an instructional video we have that actually explains the test and how it's truly used. The test itself establishes a patient's contrast sensitivity both centrally and peripherally. The test is performed one eye at a time, and there should be normal lighting in the room without glare. Patients should take sparks in as similar surroundings as possible each time so that the results can be compared over time. Let's actually take the test. So I'm taking it from my left eye, so I'm covering my right side. And on the screen, Vertical contrast gradings will appear in one of the tested areas. So I have to move the mouse to that area, click it, and then all of a sudden the next thing that appears it says click in the middle. So I move the mouse back to the middle and I click that button. And that tells the test that I'm ready to see the next image. Then I next move the mouse over to that area and the pattern just continues. And basically what's happening is in each area of the screen that gets tested, contrast gradings will gradually get more and more challenging to establish threshold values. The values are determined using a bracketing technique with reversals to really get a very accurate result in these different areas. As the test goes on, it does get more and more challenging. The location of where it appears is in a random fashion in one of these five tested areas. 
Sparks will end automatically when the threshold has been reached in each of the areas. So I scored a 92 on this test. And this is what a patient would see when they finish. It shows which I took the test, what their score was that time. It allows you to compare it to the last time you took the test. It shows you your average. It shows your best. Now for you, the physician, you have the ability to log into the website and see your patient's results, but you also have the ability to have the website automatically email you. If someone takes the test and then does well for a while, but at some point along the way, they're taking the test and they do worse. The way we have it set up is that the physician has the option with a certain setting of making it so that the website would do an automatic email if the patient does significantly worse. So here's an example of how it would look. This is a patient um, of mine, a, a fake patient, but it says that the patient did much worse compared to prior ones. And if I got an email like this, it's really a good clue that you need to see the patient much quicker, or at least maybe have the patient take the test again and see if it's a real change or if it's just variability. But this is really helpful with figuring out, identifying, is this person changing that maybe we wouldn't have detected otherwise if they weren't doing home testing? Now, when we first developed Sparks, we originally started off with 10 levels of contrast testing. And when we did in some pilot studies, what we realized is the vast majority of people were getting similar scores of what they're the best that they see, their thresholds. And it was not differentiating well between disease, glaucoma, and controls, as a lot of people's threshold values at the time were at level 7. So what we did is we added more levels to the test to better differentiate people's thresholds, and we also extended it to get the full range of testing to get the log values between 0 and 2.35, to a total of 17 levels that are tested. And by doing this also, we decrease the step size between different intervals of the, of the contrast levels, especially narrowing right around the area where most people's thresholds were. Now the way the scores are set up is that log base score is then converted into a score out of 20, making each area tested a possible, having a possible score of 0 through 20, which makes a cumulative score out of 100. In our normative database, a score of 90 is in the 92nd percentile. A score of 80 is in the 40th percentile. A score of 70 is in the 9th percentile. And the score of 70 is a very important number because that's often a big differentiator where you start to get worried about disease versus having someone's eye who is healthy. Now those were the values for the entire population of our normative database study. But what you can look at very clearly here is that age matters also. And as someone gets older, their contrast scores tend to get lower. So if someone was 20 years old and they scored in the 70s, that might be a real issue. But if someone's 80 years old and they score in the 70s, they still might be fine. Age matters on the scores. Repeatability is also quite important. I touched on earlier in that example in the very beginning about test, retest, repeatability. You want to know how accurate a test is. And so the coefficient of repeatability is trying to say, all right, if someone took the test and then took it again in the same exact day, how closely related were their scores be? In our various studies, and one of the ones that I published, the one at the top, in the glaucoma patients, the scores were plus or minus 6.7 in glaucoma, plus or minus 5.6 in controls. In a study out of, with controls out of a colleague, uh, Dr. Gupta, a plus or minus about 10. Another one that she published, about plus or minus plus 10. And another one out of India, which had an average of about plus or minus 6. Since then, and this is not published, but I have reviewed my patients, um, their reproducibility, of home testing. And I looked at my 80 patients that have, um, when I looked at this, which was 
about after about four months of data um, with those patients. And the co coefficient of repeatability uh, of my patients when I've tested them at home when looking at the total score was about plus or minus seven points, which is pretty close to the reproducibility of when I had my patients tested in a very standard clinical setting uh, where there was a research, uh, research co coordinator supervising versus just home testing with a patient doing it on their own. And that's encouraging. I'm now going to start showing you some data from published clinical trials involving SPARKS. When looking at the scores of SPARKS based on different levels of optic nerve damage, when you look at glaucoma patients in the column on the left, they on average score worse than glaucoma suspects who on average score worse than controls. And you can see that the average numbers at the bottom, 59.4, about 69, about 74, that there's a big change uh, between someone who's got a healthy optic nerve versus someone who does not. But if you look at the glaucoma section in the top, in someone with mild glaucoma with minimal optic nerve damage, they can still score quite well in sparks. So there's not an exact number where there's a cutoff of definitive disease versus healthy. There can be overlap with a healthy eye if someone has mild disease. Here is another study that has been published looking at very similar things uh, where compared to glaucoma patients, people who had optic nerve uh, possible optic nerve changes but not definite glaucoma and controls and lo looked at the total spark score it showed very nicely that people with a unhealthier optic nerve score worse than someone with a healthy optic nerve and it really differentiates the groups quite well and statistically and you can see the averages at the bottom very much differentiating these groups at the same time, you can see that in the glaucoma patients at the top of the box plot, the people with very mild optic nerve changes, that the overlap still occurs, and that some people with very mild glaucoma damage will score very similar to those who are controls. Here's a nice way of looking at it, though. Let's say you had someone with an average size optic nerve, not a big or small one where it could be a little bit different when you look at the cup. And what you'll notice is once you start to get some real thinning, where you look at level 5 on the DDLS scale, where you start scoring below a 70. Remember, that was kind of my magical number of where I, in my head, have a differentiation of is it healthy, is it not, where does it start to really get more worried. And the more changes to the optic nerve, the lower the scores. When looking at Another study looking at glaucoma patients versus glaucoma suspects versus controls with that magical number for uh, 70 for the total score in SPARKS and was able to show a sensitivity of 80% and 93% specificity for glaucoma. When looking at the individual areas of the test, if you looked at one of the, the lowest area score in sparks and if someone's lowest score was below 14 in one of those tested areas the sensitivity for detecting glaucoma was 84 percent with 85 percent specificity a different study using sparks when it compared cataract patients versus people with healthy eyes as you'd expect those with clear lenses scored better than those with lens opacities which makes sense the more lens opacity, the worse the contrast score. I mean, we all have patients with advanced cataracts who say, I have trouble with nighttime driving. And it's not just glare, uh, it's just in general, when there's poor contrast, it's tough to see well. And the more advanced lens changes, the more difficulty someone has. In a publication involving SPARKS, which evaluated macular degeneration patients versus controls, you can see a significant decrease in the scores in the macular degeneration group compared to controls. When you look at the second row where the scores of just the central area are highlighted, you can see a marked decrease in scores in macular degeneration patients compared to controls. That makes sense because if someone has got macular degeneration, you expect their central vision to be very affected. What's very interesting though is the extent that the peripheral areas 
left lower quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower, right upper quadrant. AMD versus control is the peripheral vision was also affected with contrast sensitivity. The next two slides go through what I consider are the most meaningful results of the studies that have involved sparks thus far. This particular one, this study is a longitudinal study of glaucoma patients, where each year patients were assessed, and the goal of this study was to identify the predictors of rapid glaucoma progression, which was defined as the visual field getting worse by two decibels per year. Each year, these patients had their acuity tested, their visual field, their contrast tested with sparks, their eye pressure, their optic nerve was examined, they had an OCT, they had a performance-based test where they were evaluated and integrated, they had a quality of life questionnaire, they had a glaucoma symptom scale questionnaire. All these things were done each year to identify who is going to get worse. After one year, in the group of people that got worse fast, the fast glaucoma progressors, there were two tests that identified with statistical significance what could pr predict who would get worse quickly, whose glaucoma would progress rapidly. It was the visual field itself and sparks. Now the fact that the visual field identified people who were going to get worse by their visual field is a statistical result of how, the t of how progression was defined. Meaning if you define a test that's going to get worse by OCT, the OCT then has to get worse. If you define a worsening by visual field, the visual field therefore had to have gotten worse. So the one that really had an independent way of looking at this was Sparks. And Sparks was able to show that after one year it could predict whose visual field was going to get worse quickly. Not eye pressure, not other contrast sensitivity tests, not OCT, not acuity, it was Sparks. In that same study, now with four years of data, when you look at the results of the performance-based tests, so these are the ones where you have a patient get evaluated and, and grade how well they do. If you look at how the people got worse over that period of time in their per ability to perform visually related tasks, Sparks was the most closely related to who would get worse and who would not get worse. In a different study out of India that looked at a compressed version of these performance-based tests, which looked at recognizing facial expression, detecting motion, recognizing signs, locating objects, if you really stop and think, those are incredibly important things for someone's vision. Can you see who's next to you? Can you identify? Can you see who you're talking to? When you're driving, can you tell what sign you're coming up to? If you're in your own home, do you know where things are around you? These are really important things for people related to their vision. And in this study, they looked at various aspects of vision and how they related to these performance-based tests. And if you compare the visual field and Sparks results, Sparks had higher correlations in visual fields comparing them to people's ability to perform these visual-related tasks. In addition, it also is more closely related to their visual functioning questionnaire. Now I'm hoping that I've convinced some of you that home testing is valuable for patients that can really help them in making sure we take care of them properly. And I hope you see the value in Sparks as a potential tool uh, to fill that gap. But just because you like something doesn't mean it's actually going to work in your practice. And this is another difficult thing, is adjusting how your practice works is important to making sure that anything that you change in your practice is going to be successful. To implement a test like Sparks as a home monitoring test, you need the doctors in your practice, your staff, and the patients to all be in agreement. This is a, a helpful thing everyone needs to buy in. To really make it work effectively, you need to make sure the structure within your practice will work for home testing. You need to figure out who's going to actually register the patient. Is it the doctor? Is it someone at the front desk? Is there a person for checkout? Is it a nurse? Is it a technician? But someone needs to be dedicated and knowledgeable at Sparks of who's going to register the patient so that each patient can get their own account so that they can take the test. At the same time, who's going to keep in touch and track their scores? Is it the doctor in the practice? Is it a qualified nurse, another professional? But someone needs to be in charge and that needs to be laid out in advance. It can't just be here's a test, go take it and let's see how this goes because that won't be successful. And you also have to be really committed to this because Let's say that I gave your practice the fanciest, most expensive, most advanced technology OCT ever created. 
I can guarantee on day one it's not going to go smoothly. On day one, you're going to find glitches. You're going to realize stuff you didn't know before. And the same is true with any test that there is. It includes Sparks also. There is a learning curve for a patient. There's a learning curve for a practice to know how to do this. But I will say, home testing is a really helpful thing for patients and can really improve the care that we provide and hopefully lets us not miss people who are getting worse so that we can provide better care for our patients going forward. What I do when I enroll patients in Sparks is once they agree they want to do home monitoring in addition to their office visits, I have an email sent to them. Dear so-and-so, like we talked about in the office, I'd like to have you start monitoring your vision each month at home with an online test called Sparks. Taking the test a few times within a day or two every month is very helpful. For example, you could take it three times in a weekend in July, then three times in a weekend in August. Taking it every day is not that helpful, as it's very hard to interpret your results. This video on YouTube explains the test. There's actually a video for both doctors and patients to give more detailed instruction uh, than what this lecture provides. Each patient gets their own Sparks identification number, which when a patient is enrolled, that's how they're uh, tracked in a de-identified way. And then I give them direct, uh, there, there's a different website for patients to use, a different version than for physicians to track their patient scores. And I also mention a few uh, frequently things we run into how to minimize issues with taking the test uh, that are in the instructional videos, but still I think are important to go over in that it's important to take the test on a computer or a tablet as a cell phone screen is too small. Please keep taking the test until it finishes and shows your score. At the end of the test, the contrast gradings are very dim and they're challenging to see, and people should keep going, even if they think, even if they think they're guessing, uh, to complete the test. And each time you take the test, have the same lighting in the room and use the same computer so that your results over time can be accurately compared. Now, while I'm very enthusiastic on home testing with Sparks, I'm also aware of the fact that it's not for everybody. And when you enroll patients, you should make sure that they're computer literate and that they're a good patient qualified for monitoring themselves at home. Uh, unfortunately, here's an email I received back after enrolling a patient of mine that I probably should not have. Dr. Richmond, try it again. Have run out of time. Must leave for three hours. Will attempt again. The question being, is it malfunction of the laptop or me? Usually when something of import they didn't even write importance, but when something of import needs to be done, I go to the library where computers are sound. So it's not for everybody, but there's a high percent of patients who could do this test properly, and it would really enhance the care that you're providing to them. Thank you very much.